Hi, and welcome to this Latino Ministry for Christ channel. Before we proceed to the reflection you have come to see, I want to invite you to subscribe to the channel, to activate the bell, to give us a like, to share this video, and to leave your comments. This will allow the algorithms to promote the reflections so that more people may be reached with the gospel. God bless you. In the reflection for today, whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. 29-year-old Martin Lenny Skotnik had no intention of being a hero on January 26, 1982. The Congressional Budget Office clerk in Washington, D.C. was having a normal winter day when Air Florida Flight 90 crashed into the 14th street bridge over the Potomac River shortly after takeoff. Those who survived the tragic accident faced death when the plane sank in the freezing waters of that river. A rescue helicopter dropped a rope to one of the survivors, but Priscilla Tirado was too weak to hold on. Lenny Skutnik saw what was happening and jumped into the icy waters. He swam towards her and carried her back to shore, saving her life. Two weeks later, President Ronald Reagan invited Skutnik to attend the State of the Union address and describing the accident, he said, we saw the heroism of one of our young government employees. Martin Lenny Skutnik, who when he saw a woman lose her grip on the helicopter line, without hesitating, he dove into the water and dragged her to safety. On that day, Skutnik was honored by the President of the United States, not because he tried to draw attention to himself, but because he did the right thing at the time of crisis. Satan, the enemy of our souls, tries to convince us that we must make sure that everything we do in this life is seen and praised by others. However, God in His Word reminds us that attempts to promote ourselves eventually backfire. The scripture tells us in the book of Proverbs, don't demand an audience with the king or push for a place among the great. It's better to wait for an invitation to the head table than to be sent away in public disgrace. Just because you've seen something. Book of Proverbs chapter 25 verses 6 to 7. In today's reflection, we are going to consider what the scripture advises and warned us when seeking our vain glory. The Apostle Paul wrote in the first letter to the Corinthians, so whatever you eat or drink, or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. First letter to the Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 31. Believers must be motivated to give glory to God in everything we do, or decide not to do. In all cases, the question is to ask ourselves if this activity will bring me pleasure, material gain, or status. Though in context, this verse reminds us not to err by imposing rules and regulations on ourselves or others about what we can or cannot eat, or what we should or should not drink. In its widest application, this is a life challenge for all believers. This verse reminds us that everything we do should be done for the glory of God whether we find ourselves alone or in the company of others. Whether we are trust 
into the affairs of the daily life or quietly confined to the isolation of a sick bed. Our attitudes and actions should be such as to reflect positively on the glory of God reflected in our lives. But there is yet another reason why whatever we do should be for the glory of God. And this verse reminds us that it is connected with sincere, honest, and loving concern for others. As the verse told us, whether we eat or drink or do anything else, let us do it all for the glory of God. That includes when you and I pray for someone, whether they are in need sickness or distress, or help someone either emotionally or financially. After doing so, we cannot go to every street corner to proclaim what we have done, what we have achieved, as if hoping that others will recognize us and give us a sign of approval. It is for this reason that the ways of the Lord seem to be contrary to what you and I and the world expect. Many times it seems to people that we are going in the opposite direction to what it is the norm of the ordinary world. Whether we are immersed in the drudgery of the daily tasks of our lives or quietly watching television, we must do everything for the glory of God. Whatever we do during the day or whatever activity we engage during the night hours, should be done to His praise and glory. If we find ourselves in difficulties or when we are busy in some spare time, it should always be to glorify the Lord. For example, when we decide to watch a movie that is suggested to us, recommended, or advertised as something very entertaining and fun. And in its development, we see that out of every ten words, one or two are to curse or to swear using the name of Christ, or that it is plagued with obscene scenes of nudity, adultery, etc. Let us ask ourselves, does this bring something good to our lives? Am I honoring God with this? I know that this goes very against how most believers today view this issue. They say, ah, it's something harmless. It doesn't affect my spiritual life. Do you really honestly think that that's the way it is? That it doesn't affect you at all? I will leave you meditating on that. I want to invite you to consider something else regarding this topic. The vainglory that we yearn to be admired for something we do in this life. Look what the scripture teaches in the case in which Jesus performs a miracle, and it's not just any miracle. It is about reviving someone from the death. The Gospel of Mark tells us, Jesus got into the boat again and went back to the other side of the lake, where a large crowd gathered around him on the shore. Then a leader of the local synagogue, whose name was Jairus, arrived. When he saw Jesus, he fell at his feet, pleading fervently with him, My little daughter is dying, he said. Please come and lay your hands on her. Heal her so she can leave. Jesus went with him, and all the people followed, crowding around him. Gospel of Mark, chapter 5, verse 21 to 24. We know that in the following verses, the healing of a woman who had suffered continuous bleeding for 12 years occurs. And in verse 35, Mark's narration continues. While he was still speaking to her, messengers arrived from the home of Jairus, the leader of the synagogue. They told him, your daughter is dead. There is no use troubling the teacher now. But Jesus overheard them and said to Jairus, Don't be afraid, just have faith. Then Jesus stopped the crowd and wouldn't let anyone go with him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. When they came to the home of the synagogue leader, Jesus saw 
much commotion and weeping and wailing. He went inside and asked, Why all this commotion and weeping? The child isn't dead. She's only asleep. The crowd laughed at him, but he made them all leave, and he took the girl's father and mother and his three disciples into the room where the girl was lying. Holding her hand, he said to her, Talita kum, which means little girl, get up. And the girl, who was 12 years old, immediately stood up and walked around. They were overwhelmed and totally amazed. Jesus gave them strict orders not to tell anyone what had happened, and then he told them to give her something to eat. Gospel of Mark, chapter 5, this time verses 35 to 43. Is it not incredible to see that Jesus could have gone back to those who laugh at him by saying that the girl was only sleeping? He could have gone back before the people to declare the miracle he had done. And honestly speaking, he would have every right and reason to do so, because he is the Son of God. However, the Lord's attitude was to tell them to give her something to eat, and he quietly left through the back door of that house. Frankly, some of us would have walked out of the front door with a big eagle, with our hands up and letting the crowd know what we had done what we had accomplished. That story reminds me of a visit I made to a church in the beautiful city of Cartagena, Colombia, to which I had been invited and agreed to go. After a long preaching of an hour and a half by the female pastor of the congregation, she extended another half hour to give a testimony in which she said that she had visited a brother who was going through great difficulties and tribulations. She told the congregation how she had restored the brother and how she has raised him from his condition. And I asked myself at that moment, had it been the pastor or had it been the divine anointing, the prayer and the intervention and the restoration of the Lord? Because at no time in the next 30 minutes that she spoke, did she mention at all that thanks to the Lord in His limitless goodness and mercy had worked in that person's life. All the credit was attributed to herself as a pastor, as a prophetess. My dear brothers, Nothing we do or say in this life give us the right to take away the glory to whom it belongs, to God and to Christ, His only begotten Son. If you and I are vessels in God's hand of some miracle of faith in the lives of someone who suffer or is in distress or who is in need, let us thank God for it, but let us humbly acknowledge that it is all by the mercy of God. The glory belongs solely to the author of life, to God and to His firstborn Son, Jesus. Pride, arrogance, and haughtiness are signs of a spiritual cancer, and also allows us to see that we do not really have Christ in our hearts. All that we are and all the choices we make must be for His glory. All the thoughts of our mind and all the motives of our hearts must be an open book, so that when others observe it, our life may proclaim that everything is for the glory of God. Let us take to heart this simple instruction from Paul, that whether we eat drink or do anything else, we do it for the glory of God. I will end with this beautiful promise in the scriptures. Father, I want this whom you have given me to be with me where I am. Then they can see all the glory you gave me because you loved me even before the world began. Gospel of John chapter 17 and verse 24. My dear friend and brother, Whenever we are faced with a choice in life, let us consider two important things that should help guide our behavior. First, does my conduct or choice glorifies the Lord? And secondly, 
could my negative action or, or attitude affect my Christian witness or have a detrimental effect on my neighbor? Let us end by asking ourselves reverently and honestly, does my behavior honor you? Do my actions and attitude bring glory to God or am I tarnishing His holy name? O oh Lord our God, how we long to be someone whose life is a living testimony of your goodness and grace and whose only desire is to live our lives to glorify you. Take our life, Lord, and may your will be done in all that we say and do today. Use us as a vessel for your praise and glory so that you increase and we decrease until Christ lives in us and through us to his praise and glory. We ask this of you in the holy name of Jesus Christ, your Son. Amen.